गुड मॉर्निंग क्लास एंड वेलकम टू अनदर लेक्चर इन सस्टेनेबल एनर्जी टेक्नोलॉजी इन द लास्ट क्लास वी आर डिस्कसिंग द वेरियस टाइप्स ऑफ बायोफ्यूल्स एंड हाउ फ्रॉम व्हाट टाइप ऑफ रॉ फीड स्टॉक यू आर प्रोड्यूसिंग दिस बायोफ्यूल्स इंपैक्ट्स देयर इकोनॉमिक पोटेंशियल इन टर्म्स ऑफ हाउ मच एनर्जी यू आर गेटिंग आउट ऑफ दिस बायोफ्यूल्स हाउ मच सीओ2 सेविंग्स यू आर गेटिंग फ्रॉम यूजिंग दिस बायोफ्यूल्स इंसटेड ऑफ फॉसिल फ्यूल्स so when we looked at say ethanol biofuel which is used in uh, cars as a substitute for petrol from corn feed stock we saw that its net energy ratio was small which means you are not getting sufficient energy out of it when you are converting corn growing corn and converting corn to ethanol and its co2 emissions are also quite high which means you are not getting substantial greenhouse gas savings in contrast if you are using sugar cane for example to produce ethanol you are getting high energy ratios which means you are generating a lot of extra energy in addition to what you are investing and you are getting quite low co2 emissions per megajoule of yield of energy which means you are saving a lot of co2 when you are shift shifting from a from a uh, from petrol to sugar cane based ethanol similarly if you use switch grass which is more of a, a pilot stage process right now you are getting negative co2 emissions because the switch grass process itself is usually grown in barren lands where there was nothing growing initially so you are actually getting a lot of co2 savings which is on the negative so these are actually sequestering carbon from the atmosphere in addition to whatever has been converted to ethanol so so this kind of shows that in order to understand the sustainability of a biofuel or a biomass based energy source you have to see how it was initially produced and based on that only you can make a sustainability assessment another sustainability aspect is how long does it take for that biofuel feedstock to grow and regenerate for example grasses and fast growing crops like sugarcane corn switchgrass takes half a year to regenerate while fast growing timber uh, like uh, uh, like that is used in uh, uh, timber industry takes 2 to 3 years to regenerate so these can be considered as uh, sustainable crops for biofuel production because the regeneration times are not significant however if you are looking at using forest timber for biofuel or biomass production which has high regeneration times of 25 years or 91 years then these cannot be considered sustainable in the next slide what we will see is the potential of having additional biomass based feed stocks grown in lands that are not competing with current uh, human land use or ecologically sensitive land areas so this slide shows the available and suitable land for certain types of biomass feedstock production here available land excludes the land that is currently under forests currently used for grazing or for food crop growth or protected areas so you are excluding all agricultural animal husbandry land areas you are excluding forested areas you are excluding national parks so no ecological sensitive land areas so what is the total amount of land that is available in each continent that has been listed here which is suitable for certain types of biofuel crop production like miscanthus grass switch grass canary grass poplar trees willow trees and eucalyptus trees which are fast growing timber and hence considered sustainable so if you look at this charts here we see that the largest potential bioenergy area lies in the sub saharan africa which is the africa which is uh, below the uh, sahara desert there the potential bioenergy land area is 2.7 million square kilometer and the average yield per kilometer per year is also high around 25 terajoules per kilometer per year so the technical potential here is almost 70 exajoules per year of biomass production biomass or bioenergy production so africa which is expected to grow very rapidly in the next few decades can use biofuel can use biofuel as a strategy to develop itself sustainably 
there are also significant resources available in latin america another developing part of the world including brazil argentina and other countries where the potential land area is 1.6 million square kilometer with an average yield of 28 uh, terajoules per square kilometer per year giving a technical potential of 45 exajoules per year so these countries in these two continents can certainly look at biofuel production as a sustainable means to fuel its energy needs there are also medium amounts of resources available in north america europe and the pacific dream developed countries like australia new zealand japan etc around 17 to 20 exajoules per year can be grown there so these can also be used uh, to convert some of its ex existing fossil fuel based energy resources into bioenergy resources the regions that are least uh, uh, have the least potential actually are middle east and north africa followed by south asia and east asia so India, China, Middle East, North African countries in the Sahara region, these have extremely low amount of available bioenergy land area. And hence the amount of energy that you can come from the direct production of biomass is also low here. So if you think of India as a country, you do not have significant land area that is available, uh, which is not under existing human agriculture or under uh, agroforestry or uh, ecologically sensitive forest regions and hence there is less room for growth in these areas in these countries so for india primarily we cannot use land area to grow biomass crops what we need to do is to concentrate on biomass from waste or residue or do algal biomass in asia so agro waste forestry waste municipal waste or using uh, algae based production sources which does not consume land or water resources is the means for countries like india china etc to grow its uh, to uh, to use bioenergy or biomass it is also to be noted that in 2019 the total primary energy consumed worldwide was 418 exajoules and this is going to grow as we go forward right as we have seen in the very beginning of these, this course. The total available estimated technical potential is 171 exajoules both for bioenergy and biomass. So clearly, as we have discussed earlier also, bioenergy and biomass does not, is not able to fully replace all types of fossil fuel energy sources even today. And its fractional impact is going to decrease as the energy needs grow. But Certainly, the amount of energy available is high enough so that a significant fraction of the current fossil fuel energy resources can be converted to biomass and bioenergy based resources. And based on that, we see that there is a trajectory in the growth of the many important types of biomass and bioenergy resources over the years, like biodiesel, bioethanol, wood pellets are used in furnaces. They have shown a steady increase over the last few decades and we hope that this increase will continue because there is still a lot of potential in many parts of the world for these types of biofuels to be generated in a sustainable manner. Now when we look at the sustainability of biofuel feedstocks, we have to discuss the multiple generations of biofuels. In today's industry, most biofuels that are produced are first generation biofuels. So these are made from edible feedstock like edible vegetable oils and plant sugars. Example, sugar cane uh, syrup, corn syrup, rapeseed vegetable oil, palm vegetable oil, etc. So these are actually crops that are grown in agricultural practices in arable land. Now the advantage is the conversion process of converting these sugars and vegetable oils into biofuels like ethanol and biodiesel is well established and commercialized. However, it directly competes with food crops and arable land and freshwater needs. And hence, the first generation biofuels are unsustainable in the long term. Yes, their growth has fueled the initial industrialization and commercialization of biofuels. However, we need to switch as quickly as possible from first generation biofuels to later generation biofuels so that we are not competing with the increasing food, arable land and water needs of the world. 
also the greenhouse gas offsets are moderate because they need in, uh, like fertilizers water uh, tilling of land etc all of which emit co2 so from the first generation we go to the second generation of biofuels which is under intense research and commercialization currently which is the conversion of non food vegetable matter to biofuels so conversion of non food vegetable matters means you can use waste like waste vegetable oil used cooking oil for example in edible oil plants so for example there are plants like jatropha which grows in marginal land areas and who have oil seeds which are actually toxic to humans but these oil seeds can be pressed and produce vegetable oils just like your palm oil or sunflower oil and that can be used as a biofuel resource then agricultural and forestry residue like uh, sawdust wood chips from the uh, timber industry corn stove which is a residue from corn production straw which is a residue from wheat production sugarcane bagasse which is a residue from sugarcane production wood matter and grasses like switch grass miscanthus etc okay so these grasses are also can grow on uh, uh, marginal land areas that are not uh, suitable for agriculture and hence will not compete either in terms of agri uh, land areas or agricultural resources with food crops so they do not compete with food production helps in waste management so this is a very important aspect because waste management is a significant challenge in today's world so using these types of waste to produce biofuels solves two problems at once uh, you remove greenhouse gas emissions by replacing fossil fuels and you also produce sustainable waste management practices and can be grown on marginal lands however conversion process involves the breakdown of lignin and cellulosic matter into wood in wood or grasses which is currently slow and expensive process so this is primarily for the switch grass mithcanthus type of second generation biofuels so they have a lot of cellulose and lignin in their plant structure and breaking these types of organic materials to biodiesel or ethanol is a is a slow slow process currently and hence this is under it is expensive and under uh, initial production and pilot stages okay there are ways to break this down wood matter faster but the expenses are still higher so we have to decrease the expenses to make it commercially viable waste vegetable oil of course does not uh, or waste vegetable oil does not or forest residue does not have this problem you are using forest residue directly for say furnace industries or waste vegetable oil can be used directly like your rapeseed oil palm oil etc there are the uh, problem is not technical but a more of a logistical problem that you have to collect the waste from various sources in an economic manner and then use the waste to generate your biofuels in a centralized plant so collection may be costly because the waste is distributed in a large area okay. so that kind of a logistical challenge is there that needs to be overcome for a efficient utilization of this waste into biofuel production then you have the third generation of biofuels which is algae based biofuels so this is what we were talking about when we said india and east asia does not have sufficient land so if you can grow biofuel types that do not require land you solve that problem and algae are basically a generic term that i am using here for any type of autotrophic organisms that grow in water or waste water so uh, these are basically microorganisms that are growing in water or wastewater and you grow them in large tanks or wastewater pools where municipal liquid waste is coming and uh, you once this is grown this is dried and processed to produce the biofuels so this can be easily cultivated in water tanks does not compete with food or water resource once again you are simply using wastewater here so you are not consuming water as well brackish water may also work for certain types of algae so you again using non potable water resources uh, in this kinds of situations and you have potential high greenhouse gas savings because algae uh, sequester a lot of co2 from the atmosphere so uh, the co2 impact is usually negative and algae can grow very rapidly and the technology however the problem here is the technology to extract biofuels from algae is not very well developed indeed our research group is currently uh, working partly on developing this kind of technology where we are trying to produce algae from biodiesel okay 
and the development is in research stages currently. Then you have fourth generation biofuels. These are using genetically engineered algae, which are genetically engineered to artificially enhance the lipid content growth. And so it is basically you are genetically tweaking these microorganisms to enhance the amount of lipid it produces because this lipid you are extracting to produce your biodiesel. Okay. So here the this is basically a, uh, an advanced way to enhance the production further. Okay. So this has high production potential as biotechnology has uh, increased rapidly in the last few decades. So we can think of genetically engineering microorganisms this way. Uh, however, the development is in very nascent stage and it is currently under research stage only. So these are the various biofuel generations. We are currently we are transitioning from first generation to second generation. Algae based biofuels are under research and may also come into uh, uh, commercialization in a few years. Genetically engineered algae is still a few decade, uh, a decade at least down the line.